Foreword of Lincoln the Lawyer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Lincoln the Lawyer by Frederick Trevor Hill. Foreword. The testimony concerning Abraham Lincoln is voluminous. The exhibits are almost numberless, but one important point in the vast record has been slighted by the mighty array of able and eminent advocates who have presented it to the world, for no one has heretofore attempted a summing up of the great president's legal career. The explanation of this neglect is simple. Lincoln's achievements as a statesman are so transcendently important that they have demanded and justly received exhaustive and well-nigh exclusive consideration compared with his historic guidance of the nation his experience at the bar has appealed to his biographers as being merely episodic but if it be true that the statesman's legal training qualified him for his great task if it be probable that without such training he could not have accomplished his stupendous results if it be possible that he would never have been called to the high station unless he had been admitted to the bar then surely the story of his professional life deserves more than a passing comment a paragraph or even a chapter it is certainly strange that the literature inspired by lincoln's record though vast in quantity and rich in quality should include no special study of his legal aptitudes one autobiographical volume of life in the illinois circuit is coupled with his name but most of the notable histories dispose of his twenty-three years practice as an attorney in less than two chapters and the minor works bury it altogether under a mass of unauthentic antidote and trivial reminiscence but because the influence of lincoln's legal training can be plainly traced in many of his most momentous actions because there is evidence that this training proved invaluable to him at critical moments because he lived true to the noblest ideals of his profession and was in the highest meaning of the words a great lawyer the treatment of which the historians have accorded his professional career seems inadequate to the writer and it is to justify this conclusion that these pages are submitted the writer gratefully acknowledges the assistance of all those historians and biographers whose works contain any authentic information concerning lincoln's career at the bar he also desires to record his appreciation to the courtesy of the court clerks and other officials who kindly facilitated his work in the examination of the old records of the illinois circuit courts and to express his thanks to the hon robert lincoln major william h lambert the hon robert r hitt the hon adlai e stevenson the hon james haynes the hon james ewing general alfred orndorff mr isaac n phillips the hon james hoblet and other members of the illinois bar and to mr e m prince mr george p davis mrs jesse palmer weber and other officers of the illinois state historical society and the mclean county historical society for their generous and efficient aid especially is he indebted to the late judge lawrence weldon of the united states court of claims the last surviving member of the bar who traveled the circuit with lincoln who shortly before his death placed at the writer's disposal his recollections of mr lincoln as a lawyer and his reminiscences of the days when he and the great president practiced together on the old eighth illinois circuit since the first edition of this volume was issued in eighteen six a more exhaustive examination of mr lincoln's record at the bar has disclosed additional facts and figures of importance which have been incorporated in the footnotes and appendices of the present edition for his assistance in procuring part of this additional material the writer is indebted to the courtesy of charles w moores esq of the indiana bar march nineteen twelve frederick trevor hill in the preface chapter one of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill lincoln's mythical birthright to the law 
one of his eulogists declares that lincoln is not a type he stands alone no ancestors no fellows no successors the facts fully justify the tribute assuredly the great emancipator was a man apart without equals or followers and he himself waived all claims to ancestry i don't know who my grandfather was he remarked and am much more concerned to know what his grandson will be but though the first american knew little about his family history and cared less his biographers had devoted themselves to the subject with zeal and enthusiasm and thanks to them we now know who his progenitors were even to the sixth or seventh generation and are fully informed of their domiciles and wanderings and the various stations of life to which it pleased god to call them the result of all this exhaustive and laborious research is mainly negative but there are those who find signs in the record and among the strange conclusions which have been derived from its perusal perhaps the strangest is that lincoln inherited his legal talents and aptitudes certainly nothing could be more unwarranted than this for little as there is in his origin to account for him as a man there is even less to explain him as a lawyer unless we accept the well-supported but not established contention that the great president was descended from the lincolns of hingham massachusetts there is absolutely no precedent in the family for his choice of a profession and those who struggled to prove that he came of a race of jurists and statesmen virtually defeat themselves when they take refuge in the genealogical records of new england samuel lincoln the founder of the massachusetts house had four sons and the descendants of some of those sons undoubtedly attained high distinction at the bar indeed one of them the attorney general of jefferson's cabinet declined a nomination to the supreme court of the united states and at least two others were lawyers of recognized ability but the trouble with these facts is that the distinguished attorney general and the other legal luminaries belonged to branches of the massachusetts family with which abraham lincoln was only remotely if at all connected and the shadowy claim that he had any birthright to the law utterly disappears when the record is more closely examined the original lincoln of hingham was an englishman who came to america apprenticed as a weaver his fourth son mordecai from whom the president is supposed to have descended was a blacksmith footnote the genealogists are careful to explain that a blacksmith was not really a blacksmith in those early days but rather an iron worker new england historic genealogic register volume forty one page one fifty three this nice distinction does not affect the question at issue however comforting it may be for other purposes End footnote. his eldest son another mordecai was a miller and blacksmith his eldest son john the virginia john of the biographies was a farmer and his third son abraham lincoln's great-grandfather was likewise a tiller of the soil this leaves only his grandfather and father to be accounted for and the former was a farmer and the latter a carpenter a weaver two blacksmiths three farmers and a carpenter those are all the callings represented by the president's forefathers for seven generations small wonder then that the believers in heredity have recourse to the collateral branch of the distantly related massachusetts family for precedence entitling the son of a backwoods carpenter to enter the honorable profession of the law this is virtually all that is known of lincoln's antecedents upon which to predicate the theory of his natural talents for the law it is more than possible that lincoln inherited many sterling qualities of mind and character from the worthy mechanics and farmers from whom he was descended but there is very little on the face of the record to encourage any definite claims on their behalf for the shaping of his career certainly the paternal influence was not inspiring his father was an ignorant man amiable enough but colorlessly negative without strength of character and with no ambition worthy of the name his only effort to influence his son's future was a half-hearted attempt to teach him carpentry but he soon abandoned such instruction and allowed the boy to occupy himself with odd jobs about the farm when he could not hire him out to neighbors in need of an extra hand 
Nancy Lincoln, the lad's mother, was better educated than most of the pioneer women. She taught her husband to read and write, and sent her son to his first school. But she died when he was only about nine years old, and it was his stepmother who encouraged his ambition for education. All the misinformation concerning Lincoln's professional career is not, however, derived from the experts in heredity. A great deal of nonsense has been written about his early years, and a grave effort has been made to prove him a youth of exceptional promise, a brilliant scholar, and a prodigy of application and industry. As a matter of fact, he did not begin to develop mentally until he was about 18. Even in the prime of life, his intellectual processes were not quick, and there is nothing to indicate that he was a particularly industrious boy. Five pedagogues, two in his birthplace, Kentucky, and three in Indiana, share the honor of contributing to his elementary education. But had their pupil been never so gifted, they could scarcely have discovered it, for this schooling amounted to less than a year in all, about as long as it must have taken some of the minor biographers to collect and record the pointless reminiscences of his alleged schoolmates. He lived the healthy outdoor life of the average country lad of the settler days, exhibiting no precocity or abnormal tendencies to distinguish him from his fellows. He was fond of tramping about the country, not caring much for shooting or fishing, but entering into other sports and pastimes with zest and spirit, and excelling at games requiring strength, not in love with work for work's sake, but willing to do his share without grumbling seeing no visions of coming greatness and troubling himself with no ponderous thoughts concerning his career this is the sum and substance of his childhood and the real inspiration of his very human development has suffered at the hands of the enthusiastic chroniclers who picture him as a child of destiny dreamy mysterious and miraculously endowed in one respect he was undoubtedly exceptional he liked reading an unusual trait among pioneer settlers of the Middle West, but exaggerated emphasis has been placed on this characteristic, which was by no means unique. For instance, the books which comprised his earliest reading are admiringly called to our attention with comments which suggest that they foreshadow his career. The list includes Aesop's Fables, Robinson Crusoe, Pilgrim's Progress, A History of the United States, and Weems Life of Washington. There is, of course, nothing remarkable about this catalogue. Almost every item in it formed part of the reading of every intelligent American boy of the period, whether he lived in the backwoods or in the city. Indeed, the only really notable fact about the much quoted list is that Lincoln worked three days at twenty five cents a day to compensate for an accidental injury to the life of Washington, which he borrowed from blue nose crawford there was nothing angelic about the youthful lincoln however he considered blue nose as mean as any other boy would have thought him under similar circumstances and we know that he nicknamed and otherwise ridiculed the stingy old farmer but his dawning character is indicated by his prompt recognition of the claim and his faithful payment of the damages this is one of the few stories touching lincoln's youth which has any bearing on his temperament or his career most of the anecdotes of his boyhood exhibit him as a child of superhuman qualities and many of them served to misrepresent other great men before he was born one episode founded on fact however is responsible for a grave misunderstanding about the impulse which prompted him to follow the law we know from his own statement that before he had been many years in gentryville indiana he had borrowed from one source or another all the books he could lay his hands on for a circuit of fifty miles and among the generous lenders was a mr turnham this gentleman lent him a copy of the revised statutes of indiana and if we are to believe the biographers it was this volume as dull a tome as ever lay between sheepskin covers which appealed to his boyish imagination and inspired his ambition for the profession of the law end of chapter one Chapter 2 of Lincoln, the Lawyer, 
this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill chapter two the real source of lincoln's professional aspirations historically this copy of the indiana statutes is interesting it is undoubtedly the first law book which lincoln ever read but that its musty dry as dust pages could have fascinated an out-of-doors boy of seventeen or imbued him with any intense longing for a legal career is against all human probability one biographer asserts that he read it with all the excitement and avidity with which an ordinary boy would read the romances of dumas and another caps this with the statement that his hero read and re-read it until he had almost committed its contents to memory and in after years when any one cited an indiana law he could usually repeat the exact text and often give the number of the page chapter and paragraph to appreciate the absurdity of such statements it is only necessary to examine the volume in question it is dull as only statute law can be dull about as easily memorized as the dictionary and of no enduring authority only a short time after he had read this compilation the legislature amended some of its provisions annulled others and generally revised the contents and yet we are gravely told that in after years when any one cited an indiana law he could usually repeat the exact text and often give the numbers of the page chapter and paragraph of this obsolete revision what a useful accomplishment that is a fair sample of the grotesque caricaturing which lincoln has suffered at the hands of sentimentalists not too deeply familiar with human nature to say nothing of statute lore but those who believe in the epoch-marking influence of the volume in question are not satisfied with the concession that it was the first law which abraham lincoln read they contend that it not only inspired his choice of a profession but also imparted his first knowledge of american government and they conjure up a diverting picture of the anointed youth reading with eager eyes and glowing cheeks the wondrous words of the declaration of independence and the constitution of the united states which prefaced its pages this conception does credit to the imagination but it fades under the cold light of facts long before he borrowed turnham's famous statutes lincoln had read at least one history of the united states to say nothing of parson weems's life of washington possibly he had never read either the constitution or the declaration in its entirety until the indiana revision came into his possession but to claim that he obtained his first insight into american government at the age of seventeen from that volume is sacrificing sense to sentiment moreover it argues a lamentable ignorance of the wisdom dispensed at the country stories especially in a community where to use a common phrase of the times there was a politician on every stump jones's store was the popular forum of gentryville and lincoln had been a constant attendant at all its sessions since he entered his teens there he had met and talked with lawyers listened to stump speakers tried a little oratory himself and won considerable reputation as a ready talker among his fellow townsmen and there most important of all he had heard of the doings of the booneville court and had kept in intimate touch with its proceedings life at gentryville indiana with its dull trivial round of hard labor at delving grubbing corn shucking rail splitting and the like could not have been exhilarating doubtless it was a happy enough life for an easy-going good-humored healthy growing boy but he would have been stupid indeed if he had not availed himself of such amusements as the neighborhood afforded and the one great diversion and intellectual stimulant of the community came through the sessions of the booneville court 
boonville was fully fifteen miles from gentryville but people often travelled farther than that to attend the civil and criminal trials at the county seat every term of the court of course meant a market and the pioneers looked forward to the coming of the circuit judge not only because it promised entertainment but also for business reasons the court was their theatre their lecture platform their common meeting-place their centre of government and to it they flocked for mental refreshment and recreation in a holiday spirit entire families would sometimes make the trip virtually living in their wagons while the session lasted and the proceedings supplied material for conversation and discussion long after the event altogether it was a great occasion and the courthouse was usually full to overflowing it is not surprising then that young lincoln cheerfully trudged to boonville on foot and seldom missed a trial there were rare exhibitions of human nature in the legal combats which he witnessed in the little log courthouse plenty of drama and excitement in the clash of the battling attorneys and a vast deal of information for any active mind there was also grim earnest serious business transacted by the judge and juries fascinating engrossing business and doubtless the youthful lincoln listening to the crude legal champions and responding to the dawning powers within him mentally matched himself against them surely it must have been then that his imagination was first quickened and his ambition vitalized and focused unfortunately there are no records of the boonville court in existence to-day but there is evidence that he witnessed at least one hotly contested murder trial within its walls and we know that the event made a profound impression on his mind the defendant in that case was represented by one breckinridge and the advocate made such a powerful summing up for his client that young lincoln with boyish enthusiasm sought him out after the verdict to congratulate him on the speech and its result i felt he remarked to breckinridge in the white house many years afterward that if i could ever make as good a speech as that my soul would be satisfied for it was the best i had ever heard even assuming for the sake of argument that this episode occurred after he had perused the revised statutes of indiana it ought not to be difficult to decide which exerted the more powerful influence on his future career the flaming eloquence of the backwoods orator or the lifeless pages of statute law end of chapter two chapter three of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill chapter three the primitive bench and bar of indiana of course the boonville courthouse bore no resemblance to anything even remotely suggesting the domed dignity of a modern hall of justice but though no picture of the building has been preserved the loss is not important for similar structures have been accurately described by lawyers who practised in those early days for instance we know that the first courthouse at springfield destined to be the capital of illinois was erected at a cost of forty two dollars and fifty cents it was built of rough logs and consisted of one room the jury retiring to any sequestered glade they fancied for their deliberations and the indiana courts were almost as unpretentious they were either frame or log structures generally divided into two rooms the larger serving as a place of trial and the smaller as clerk's office judge's chambers and jury room combined 
at one end of the trial room there was usually a platform three feet high and on this was placed the judge's bench a rough board affair capable of seating three men in front of this platform stood a crude plank settee for the lawyers and a small table for the clerk of the court and official privacy was ensured for those dignitaries by an improvised railing consisting of a long pole fastened to the walls with withes the rest of the space was open to the public and so freely did it avail itself of the privilege that there was seldom even standing room inside the building and seats in the windows were always at a premium one of the circuit prosecuting attorneys of indiana who practised during lincoln's boyhood has left a record of his observations at fall creek the court was held in a double log cabin he writes the grand jury sat upon a log in the woods and the foreman signed the bills of indictment which i had prepared upon his knee there was not a petty juror that had shoes on all wore moccasins and were belted around the waist and carried side knives used by the hunters it must not be inferred from this that only jurors went armed and caparisoned in this fashion in the days when lincoln haunted the boonville courts everybody from the judge to the humblest spectator wore deer-hide suits and moccasins of the same material indeed he had arrived at manhood before clothing of dyed wool and tow began to be worn and for a long time afterward it was only the women who adopted such garments but the judge and juries in buckskin were shrewd and fearless administrators of justice and the lawyers who practised before them were men of equal calibre almost any one who chose to do so could follow the profession of the law there were no regular examinations for admission to the bar and a license to practice could be obtained by any applicant of good moral standing which was about the only qualification most of the practitioners lacked according to one authority if a man was a fluent talker pugnacious shrewd and able to think on his feet he was fully equipped for the duties of the profession education was not necessary and although there were a few advocates in the early history of indiana who were fairly well read none of them had any pretensions to learning indeed scholarship would have been lost on the courts to say nothing of the juries for many of the judges were uneducated some were almost illiterate and none of them well grounded in the law or versed in its technicalities general marston clark was one of the judges whose portrait has fortunately been preserved he was an uneducated backwoods muscular six-footer whose judicial costume was a hunting shirt leather pantaloons and a fox-skin cap with a long queue down his back and who wrote his name as large as john hancock in the declaration of independence truly a formidable figure of a man and although history reports that he was no lawyer his conduct of the case of one john ford demonstrates that no lawyer could trifle with him this john ford was arrested for horse stealing and his counsel interposed various technical objections to the indictment on the ground that the prisoner's name was john h ford and not plain john ford that there was no value alleged for the stolen horse and finally that the animal was not a horse but a gelding all of these preliminary pleas were overruled by the court and the trial proceeded with the result that the prisoner was convicted and sentenced to thirty-nine lashes then the defendant's attorney moved for a new trial because there was no proof that the crime had been committed in indiana judge clark was no lawyer but he saw the force of this contention and advised counsel that he would take the matter under consideration and render his decision within twenty-four hours the moment the court adjourned 
however he ordered the sheriff to see that the thirty-nine lashes were well laid on and when the court reopened next morning he gravely took up the unfinished business of the previous day he had come to the conclusion he announced that the point raised by ford's attorney was well taken and that a new trial must be granted but at this juncture the prisoner interposed in his own behalf protesting that he knew when he was beaten and that he had had enough law and desired the court to take no further trouble on his account another judge is reported to have quelled a disturbance in his court by descending from the bench and thrashing the nearest offenders to a standstill i don't know what power the law gives me to keep order in this court he admitted as he resumed his coat and the bench but i know very well the power of god almighty gave me little informalities of this sort were not infrequent but they detracted nothing from the dignity of the courts though the free and easy proceedings were sometimes astonishing as i entered the court-room relates an observer of the hudson trial the judge was sitting on a block paring his toe-nails when the sheriff entered out of breath and informed the court that he had six jurors tied up and his deputies were running down the others apparently jury duty was no more popular in those days than it is now but because these frontier courts and their presiding officers lack the formality and decorum which a later day demands it must not be inferred that there was any element of farce or travesty in the administration of the law the surroundings which to-day lend substance and dignity to courts would not have been tolerated on the frontier formalities would have divested the proceedings of all meaning and interest for the people and made a mummery out of what was real the pioneers were not peasants who had to be impressed by ceremonials and awed into a respect for authority they were thoughtful independent men governing themselves and the judges the courts and the laws were of their own making the idea of a judge maintaining order with his fists may seem ludicrous to us but judicial robes to say nothing of mace-bearers wigs and canopies would have seemed far more laughable to the settlers they possessed a natural genius for self-government recognized the authority of the law and they fulfilled it in the case of hudson before referred to where the judge was surprised at his toilet and the jury had to be corralled by sheriff's deputies the defendant a white man indicted for killing an indian was promptly convicted despite the fearful prejudice against the redskins which existed among the pioneers an exhibition of judicial temperament and regard for duty which should shame many a jury of to-day it was among men of this stamp and character that lincoln passed his boyhood and it was their administration of justice which won his respect and first encouraged him to think of a legal career End of chapter three chapter four of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill chapter four legal apprenticeship lincoln had just reached his majority when his father who always saw promising land on the other side of his fence decided to migrate from indiana and after a long journey fraught with all the hardships incidental to travel in those days the family reached decatur macon county illinois in the spring of eighteen hundred and thirty up to that time the young man had given his father the entire benefit of his services but he had long been anxious to start life on his own account and shortly after the new homestead was staked out he began to shift for himself except in the matter of health and strength he was poorly equipped to earn his own living for he had no education beyond reading writing and ciphering to the rule of three and his mental power was still largely undeveloped for a year he attempted nothing more ambitious than 
manual labour working in the immediate vicinity of his father's house at odd jobs of all sorts including the splitting of several thousand rails destined to become famous in american history one of those odd jobs took him to the village of new salem and there he became what the fell autobiography calls a sort of clerk in offutt's grocery store the duties of this office were not very onerous however and the young clerk was soon devoting every spare moment to his books people used to meet him trudging along the country roads reading as he walked customers found him stretched upon the store counter absorbed in his books and his companions reported that he studied late into the night certainly he was self-educated in the broadest sense of the term and it has been truly said that he never finished his education to the night of his death he was a pupil a learner an inquirer a seeker after knowledge never too proud to ask questions never afraid to admit that he did not know offutt's assistant however never had the slightest intention of remaining a clerk and mindful of his ambition to become a lawyer he attended a debating club made up of boys of the neighbourhood where he had a chance to practise polemics as he expressed it and speedily gained a reputation among his fellows as a dangerous opponent in argument before the days of this club however he had already demonstrated his ability as a speaker indeed he had not been long in illinois before he had talked down one local orator and as the general store was the accepted meeting-place and centre of public opinion in new salem he had unbounded opportunity to exercise his undoubted gift of gab it is not probable that the embryo lawyer obtained much information from the legal luminaries of new salem but he attended most of the trials conducted by bowling green the local justice of the peace who is said to have decided a hog case known as ferguson versus kelso by declaring that the plaintiff's witnesses were damned liars the court being well acquainted with the shoat in question and knowing it to belong to jack kelso this and other similar exhibitions of judicial temperament were possibly responsible for lincoln's first bill in the legislature which was a measure to restrict the jurisdiction of justices of the peace it could not have been aimed directly at bowling green however for he and lincoln were fast friends and long before the young student was admitted to the bar he was allowed to practise in an informal way before the eccentric justice springfield was only a few miles from new salem and there is every reason to believe that lincoln attended the sessions of the circuit court at the county seat but whatever else he may have done at this time with the definite purpose of preparing himself for his future calling he was unquestionably developing those traits of character which distinguish really great lawyers from those who are merely successful it is a significant fact that in a community where crime was virtually unknown where plain straightforward dealing was assumed as a matter of course and credit was fearlessly asked and given lincoln won an enviable reputation for integrity and honor in a moral atmosphere of this sort ordinary veracity and fairness attracted no particular attention honesty was not merely the best policy it was the rule of life and people were expected to be upright and just with one another but when a clerk in a country store walked miles to deliver a few ounces of tea innocently withheld from a customer by an error in the scales and when he made a long hard trip in order to return a few cents accidentally overpaid him he was talked about and the fact is that honest abe was a tribute not a nickname to suggest that inflexible integrity is indispensable to the make-up of a great lawyer is of course to challenge the sneer or the smile of the cynically minded 
the jests about honest lawyers have become classic and they will forever continue to delight yet despite the humorist and the cynic there is probably no profession in the world which makes greater demands upon integrity or presents nicer questions of honour or offers wider opportunities for fairness than the profession of the law the fact that many distinguished practitioners have not maintained the highest standards of the calling that most of them have compromised for monetary or momentary success that a few have actually abused their great opportunities does not in the least impeach the proposition that extraordinary integrity honour and fairness are the essential qualities of a great lawyer it merely demonstrates how rare great lawyers are of course it does not follow that because a lawyer is a good or even a great man he must be a great or even a good lawyer but one thing is certain no man deserves to be classed as a great lawyer who does not fairly exemplify the noblest aspirations of his calling if the number of litigations in which a lawyer has been engaged be the true test of professional eminence some of the modern negligence attorneys must be admitted to the highest station if the monetary importance of their clientage is to count the legal guardians of great corporate interests must outrank all who have gone before if success in the courts is the criterion aaron burr must have first honours for he never lost a case but if loftier considerations enter into the question of what constitutes a really great lawyer if it is right to demand something nobler than advocacy something broader than commercial aptitude something more influential than erudition and more enduring than success then it is proper to insist on personal character as one of the elements that determine the just rank of any member of the profession no man ever believed in his calling more thoroughly than lincoln and he had no patience with the much-mouthed charge that honesty was not compatible with its practice let no young man choosing the law for a calling yield to that popular belief he wrote if in your judgment you cannot be an honest lawyer resolve to be honest without being a lawyer choose some other occupation rather than one in the choosing of which you do in advance consent to be a knave if the writer of those lines abated anything of his boyish integrity under the stress of the workaday duties of the law his theories in regard to its practice are neither interesting nor instructive but if he lived them out and proved them practical they are of the first importance and they have a direct bearing upon his much disputed place in the profession in either event however it is fair to test lincoln the lawyer by his own standards to inquire whether his conduct as a member of the bar conformed to the reputation which he earned as a clerk in offutt's store to compare his professional ethics with his private principles to ascertain whether he compromised with his conscience in the interests of his clients and to judge his legal career accordingly End of chapter four chapter five of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill chapter five lincoln's first argument and his early attitude toward the law lincoln never sought to make himself a general favorite and yet he had not been long in new salem before he was the most popular man in the town doubtless he possessed even in those early years that power of personal magnetism which he afterward exerted so commandingly in the courts and upon all sorts and conditions of men but it is not necessary to insist upon this to explain his immediate favor with the new salemites 
he could tell a good story make a creditable stump speech give an excellent account of himself in contests of strength and hold his own against all comers in the daily debates at the village forum moreover he listened attentively when other people talked never boasted of his physical prowess and was tolerant of all intelligent opinion his extreme popularity with men of his own age is particularly remarkable however when we remember that he neither drank nor smoked for young men are apt to regard the use of tobacco and stimulants as essential to good fellowship and manly camaraderie and this was especially true of the settler days lincoln was not however a total abstainer in any strict sense of the words he did not drink intoxicants because he did not like them and he did not smoke for a similar reason judge douglas once undertook to ridicule him on this subject what are you a temperance man he inquired sneeringly no drawled lincoln with a smile i'm not a temperance man but i'm tempered in this to wit i don't drink with his elders the young storekeeper found favor for a variety of reasons they soon discovered that he knew more than any of them but never presumed upon it that he was genial and obliging always ready to lend a hand at anything from roofing a barn to rocking a baby and that he was as reliable in business matters as he was in neighborly deeds and kindnesses but perhaps his most winning quality with young and old alike was his sincere belief in his fellow-townsmen and their community local pride never had a more buoyant champion than he for him sangamon county in general and new salem in particular was the promised land and he was confident that the people were equal to the task of developing it according to its needs thus when it was first suggested that the shallow snag-bound sangamon river was navigable and might be made a great highway of commerce he eagerly championed the theory and worked with voice pen and hand to realize a practical result the sagamon is still unnavigable and new salem has disappeared but lincoln's plea for improving the waterway remains as evidence of his sincere belief in the future of the community and to show us what he could do with a weak cause at the age of twenty-one the argument is not remarkable but it is exceedingly interesting and suggestive although he was young and boyishly enthusiastic lincoln did not overstate the possibilities nor underestimate the difficulties of his case and despite the really laughable attempt which was afterward made to force the passage of the sagamon there is nothing ludicrous in his plea what he claimed sounds reasonable and what he hoped for possible even in the face of failure this early effort plainly indicates lincoln's natural aptitude for logical statement but it does more than that it displays a trait which few lawyers possess for the ability to present facts clearly concisely and effectively without taking undue advantage of them is a rare legal quality it requires not only ability but courage not only tact but character it is one of the infallible tests which distinguish the legal bravo from the jurist and it will be demonstrated in a future chapter that lincoln fulfilled it in masterful fashion it was in a circular announcing himself a candidate for the state legislature that this sangamon river argument appeared for lincoln encouraged by the goodwill of his new salem friends had decided to make trial of his political fortunes there was therefore a double temptation to indulge in extravagant promises and prophecies he believed in his cause and he wanted to please his constituents and yet there is not a word of exaggeration in the entire address it is quiet frank earnest and simple 
this circular is important in the history of lincoln's professional career not only because it contains his first argument but also because it records his earliest public comment upon law the evils of usury had been widely discussed throughout the state of illinois for some time and as there was a radical difference of opinion concerning the remedy each candidate was expected to express his views upon the much mooted question exorbitant interest was impoverishing borrowers but it was feared that stringent laws might drive capital altogether out of the country and arrest its development lincoln announced himself as favoring a strict law on the subject despite the objection that a high rate of interest might be preferable in many cases to no loan at all and his answer to this has served to shock more than one of his biographers in cases of extreme necessity he wrote there could always be means found to cheat the law while in all other cases it would have its intended effect i would favor the passage of a law on this subject which might not be very easily evaded let it be such that the labor and difficulty of evading it could only be justified in cases of greatest need this temperate announcement seems very regrettable to certain estimable historians who pull a long face and record their surprise at words which as one of them puts it sound strange enough from a man who in later life showed so profound a reverence for law but the immature lincoln was wiser and more broad-minded than his disapproving admirers he knew that the enforcement of any law depends entirely upon public opinion and he was not afraid to admit that evasions of the law were possible and under certain circumstances permissible there was no sham or pretense or hide-bound reverence for law as law in his mental make-up he believed in its spirit and not in its letter it is the shylocks and not the lincolns who pose as the champions of statutes and demand their strict interpretation but the high-minded commentators who censure lincoln's attitude in this matter might have found further evidence of youthful indiscretion in this circular where its author discusses the advisability of a proposed revision of all the state laws considering the great probability that the framers of those laws were wiser than myself he naively remarks i should prefer not meddling with them unless they were attacked by others in which case i should feel it both a privilege and a duty to take that stand which in my view might tend most to the advancement of justice could not this be twisted into an assertion that he might under certain circumstances side with those who assailed the laws a deplorably anarchical statement if law be superior to justice but it is precisely because lincoln never acted upon any such theory that his legal career is noteworthy and exceptional he never surrendered his conscience to a code his sense of justice was never cowed by the tyranny of leading cases and the decision of the highest court in the world never succeeded in convincing him that wrong was right his attitude on this subject was fully explained a few years later in an address delivered before the young men's lyceum at springfield when after urging that reverence for the law should be the political religion of the nation he defined his position in these strangely prophetic words but when i so pressingly urge a strict observance of all laws let me not be understood as saying that there are no bad laws or that grievances may not arise for the redress of which no legal provisions have been made i mean to say no such thing but i do mean to say that although bad laws if they exist should be repealed as soon as possible still while they continue in force for the sake of example 
they should be religiously observed in any case that may arise as for instance the promulgation of abolitionism one of two propositions is necessarily true that is the thing is right within itself and therefore deserves the protection of all law and all good citizens or it is wrong and therefore proper to be prohibited by legal enactments and in neither case is the interposition of mob law either necessary justifiable or excusable these wonderfully significant sentences were penned before lincoln had reached his maturity before he had actively entered on the practice of the law before the fugitive slave law was an issue and long before the dred scott case was dreamed of we shall have occasion to see that his theories were tested in the most practical manner by the very situation which he invoked as illustration and to note in his professional attitude a masterful distinction between bowing to legal authority and submitting tamely to its decrees End of chapter five chapter six of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill chapter six lincoln the law student the quality of the talk which passed over the counters of offutt's store was probably superior to the quality of its merchandise for despite the remarkable popularity of the salesman the business dwindled until it finally winked out as lincoln said of one of his later ventures at this crisis however an event occurred which set all the country talking and the passing of the village emporium was scarcely noticed black hawk an indian chief was reported to be on the war-path and the governor of the state hastily called for volunteers lincoln instantly responded and was subsequently elected captain of his company a success which he declared gave him more pleasure than any of the honors which afterward fell to his lot the so-called black hawk war lasted only a few weeks it was in many ways a ridiculous if not contemptible affair and lincoln did not reach the front until it was virtually over his company was disbanded shortly after it was formed but he re-enlisted as a private for the remainder of the campaign and was finally mustered out by a young lieutenant of the regular army whom he was destined to meet again under more dramatic auspices major robert anderson the commander of fort sumter it was characteristic of the man that at a time when military titles were the fashion lincoln did not retain his and never would permit any one to address him as captain indeed years afterward when congressmen attempted to make political capital for general cass out of that gentleman's not too distinguished record in the war of eighteen twelve he disposed of the pretensions with a laugh at his own military history by the way mr speaker he began with deep gravity did you know that i was a military hero yes sir in the days of the black hawk war i fought bled and came away i was not at stillman's defeat but i was about as near to it as cass was to hull's surrender and like him i saw the place very soon afterward if general cass went in advance of me in picking huckleberries i guess i surpassed him in charges upon the wild onions if he saw any live fighting indians it was more than i did but i had a good many bloody struggles with the mosquitoes mr speaker if i should ever conclude to doff whatever our democratic friends may suppose there is of black cockade federalism about me and thereupon they shall take me up as their candidate for the presidency i protest they shall not make fun of me as they have of general cass by attempting to write me into a military hero 
farcical as this campaign was it had nevertheless an important bearing on lincoln's professional career for it brought him to the notice of his future law partner major john t stuart one of the springfield volunteers and it was the major's friendly advice and use of his small law library which encouraged the ex-clerk to pursue his legal studies the political canvass in illinois was almost over when the veteran of the black hawk war returned to new salem but there was still time to make a few speeches in aid of his candidacy for the state legislature and he threw himself into the contest with vigor and spirit when the votes were counted however he found himself rejected the first and only time he was ever defeated by direct popular vote but lincoln had stated in the circular announcing his candidacy that if the people should see fit to keep him in the background he was too familiar with disappointments to be very much chagrined and there is no indication that he was particularly discouraged at the result although it compelled him to seek immediate employment and interfered to that extent with his preparation for the bar he had to earn his living but if he could find work which would allow him some leisure for study he did not care much what it was and when a dissolute fellow named barry who had purchased an interest in a grocery store proposed a partnership offutt's ex-clerk grasped the opportunity a more ill-assorted couple than barry and lincoln it would be difficult to imagine but their ideas of the partnership were mutually satisfactory the senior partner drank up all the profits of the business and the junior member devoted himself to the study of law as might be expected this division of the labors and responsibilities of shopkeeping was not highly remunerative and lincoln afterward remarked that the best stroke of business he ever did in the grocery line was when he bought an old barrel from an immigrant for fifty cents and discovered under some rubbish at the bottom a complete set of blackstone's commentaries that was a red-letter day in his life and we have his own word for it that he literally devoured the volumes they must indeed have been refreshing after the dry indiana statutes and if lincoln's choice of a profession must be attributed to a law-book no more plausible selection than blackstone's commentaries could possibly be made barry and lincoln virtually lived on their stock of merchandise barry drinking and lincoln eating it up and matters soon reached a crisis which drove the junior partner into the fields again where he undertook all sorts of rough farm labor from splitting rails to ploughing as a man of all work however lincoln did not prove altogether satisfactory to his employers he was too fond of mounting stumps in the field and practising polemics on the other farm hands and there was something uncomfortable about a ploughman who read as he followed the team no matter how straight his furrows ran such practices were irritating if not presumptuous and there is a well-known story about a farmer who found the hired man lying in a field beside the road dressed in his not too immaculate farm clothes with a book instead of a pitchfork in his hand what are you reading inquired the old gentleman i'm not reading i'm studying answered lincoln his wonderful eyes still on the pages of his book studying what law sir the old man stared at the speaker for a moment in utter amazement great god almighty he muttered as he passed on shaking his head but even with odd jobs and the postmastership of new salem lincoln could scarcely make ends meet and he was glad to receive the appointment of deputy to calhoun the county surveyor he was sorely in need of the salary but he would not accept the office under any misunderstanding with characteristic frankness he admitted that he knew nothing about surveying and explained that he was not of his employer's political faith being assured however that his politics made no difference he applied himself to the study of surveying and so well did he qualify himself for the work that none of his surveys was ever questioned and the information he acquired stood him in good stead when he came to practice law one of his legal opinions on a question of surveying is in existence to-day meanwhile what remained of the grocery business was sold on credit the purchasers defaulted and barry died leaving his partner to shoulder all the not inconsiderable debts 
credit in those days was freely extended and it was not considered dishonourable to evade the payment of claims which passed into the hands of speculators barry and lincoln had obtained very little when they purchased the grocery and the sellers probably parted with the firm's notes for a small fraction of their face value the men who bought paper of that sort usually sold it again at the first opportunity or traded it off for something else and thus it passed from hand to hand until some speculator who had obtained it for nothing or next to nothing appeared and demanded the uttermost farthing naturally this dubious business encouraged evasion of the debts and public opinion countenanced the repudiations but to lincoln a promise was a promise and although the action of one of the parties who had acquired his and barry's notes was particularly contemptible he stooped to neither compromise nor evasion little by little he reduced the claims and fourteen years afterward he devoted part of his salary as congressman to this purpose and finally extinguished what he jestingly termed his national debt in these days when lawyers of high standing lend themselves to the thousand and one trickeries by which bankruptcy has become a new way to pay old debts when influential firms accept retainers from insolvent clients who retain their memberships in fashionable clubs and managing clerks are encouraged to make affidavits of merit on behalf of such gentry it is refreshing to think of the struggling illinois law student who refused to take advantage of the law this episode would be of merely passing interest did it not foreshadow lincoln's conduct when face to face with the countless temptations and sophistries of the profession it is important solely because it is illustrative and characteristic of his entire legal career and it will be seen that he never consented to do anything in a representative capacity which he would not countenance in himself as an individual that he maintained the ideals of advocacy in his daily contact with the legal world and made no sacrifice of private principles in his long and active experience in a word he proved the ideals of his profession to be practical had he no other claim to recognition that service alone should entitle him to the thanks of every honest member of his profession and to far higher standing than that assigned to many acknowledged leaders of the bar it will be demonstrated however that honour and integrity were not the only rare legal qualities which distinguished lincoln the lawyer in his three-and-twenty years of practice End of chapter six chapter seven of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill chapter seven admission to the bar the primitive bench and bar of illinois his duties as surveyor carried lincoln to all parts of sangamon county and widened his acquaintance until in eighteen thirty four he felt himself strong enough to make another canvass for the legislature this time he was successful beyond his hopes securing more votes than any other candidate save one and some idea of the esteem in which his neighbors held him may be gathered from the result in new salem where he received two hundred and eight out of the two hundred and eleven ballots cast a tribute which proves that a man is sometimes a prophet even in his own country the duties of a state legislator in those days were even less confining than they are now and although the remuneration was small it enabled lincoln to drop his surveying work and devote his entire leisure to the law he had already begun to practice in an apprentice way occasionally drawing deeds and bills of sale for his neighbors and pettifogging before justice bowling green and biographers better acquainted with literary values than with law have seized upon the fact that he was not paid for this work to illustrate his generosity and helpfulness one of the recent histories states that poor as he was he never accepted a fee for such services because he felt that he was fully paid by the experience probably it more than paid him but in view of the illinois law which imposes a heavy penalty on unlicensed persons who accept compensation for attorney work 
and in light of similar provisions in the indiana revised statutes which lincoln is supposed to have memorized chapter page and verse the attempt to praise his forbearance makes a ludicrous virtue of necessity lincoln it will be remembered protested that no pseudo-partisans of his should ever make fun of him by trying to write him into a military hero but he could not protect himself on every side and his friends the eulogists have certainly done their best to make him ridiculous at the next election the young law student was again a candidate for the legislature and his friends were so anxious for his success that they raised two hundred dollars to defray the expenses of a thorough canvass he was triumphantly elected at the head of the poll and returned one hundred and ninety nine dollars and twenty five cents of the campaign fund stating to the subscribers that his total outlay had only been seventy five cents his plurality at this election was even more a personal tribute than the vote of the previous year for his services during his first term in the legislature had not been remarkable indeed there is nothing particularly noteworthy in his legislative record from the beginning to end except as it illustrates his growing political sagacity and genius for leadership it was at the close of his second term in march eighteen thirty seven that he moved to springfield he was then in his twenty-ninth year vigorous in body serious-minded and developing intellectually with every fresh mental impulse he arrived at the new state capital without money and with no baggage to speak of but soon found himself among friends joshua speed a prosperous merchant offered to share his lodging with the embryo lawyer and was promptly taken at his word this arrangement was merely temporary for a few days later major stewart in whose office lincoln had served an informal legal apprenticeship offered him a partnership and the firm of stewart and lincoln entered on the practice of law the junior partner for a time literally living in the office it is improbable that lincoln was obliged to pass any examination for admission to the bar certainly there is no record of any such formality and the existing statutes did not in express terms provide for it there was however a provision which permitted attorneys from other states to be licensed without examination which suggests that native candidates may have been subjected to some sort of mental test certainly ten or fifteen years later lincoln himself was appointed by the court to examine applicants but the requirements even at that date were not very severe and about the most important question which a novitiate had to answer was what he proposed to do for the bar in the way of an initiatory treat and this took every form from a dinner to drinks all around the date of lincoln's admission to the bar has been so frequently misstated that it may be well to give the record in full it is contained in record c of the circuit court of sangamon county on page one seventy three where under the date of march twenty fourth eighteen thirty six the hon stephen t logan presiding it is ordered by the court that it be certified that abraham lincoln is a person of good moral character and the clerk's minutes of the same term of court contain the following entry ordered that it be certified to all whom it may concern that abraham lincoln is a man of good moral character his name however does not appear on the roll of attorneys until september ninth eighteen thirty six and this was not published in the reports until march eighteen thirty seven which has led to much confusion and conflicting statements in the biographies there is no doubt however that he was legally qualified on march twenty fourth eighteen thirty six and his professional life properly dates from that day illinois was only just emerging from the condition of a frontier state in eighteen thirty six and all departments of the government were still very simply administered the judges were in some respects superior to their brethren of indiana but they were not overburdened with learning and although governor ford's history of early illinois records the name of half a dozen attorneys of reputed ability and scholarship it is doubtful if the rank and file of the primitive bar knew much more law than laymen of equal intelligence most of the illinois courthouses were log built as in indiana but in some districts the sessions were held in the bar rooms of taverns and the absence of all formality in the proceedings is best illustrated by the fact that in the circuit court of washington county held by judge john reynolds the sheriff usually heralded his honor by singing out come in boys our john is a goin to hold court to which cordial invitation those having business with the law responded 
another sheriff in union county made laudable efforts to meet the requirements of the occasion by shouting this singular announcement oh yes oh yes oh yes the honorable judge is now opened both the bench and the bar had become comparatively dignified by the time lincoln was admitted to practice but governor ford writing in a much later day expressed a fine scorn of all formalities and his comments indicate that the illinois courts were not offensively ceremonious even in the fifties in some countries he complacently observes the people are so ignorant or stupid that they have to be humbugged into a respect for the institutions and tribunals of the state the judges and lawyers wear robes and gowns and wigs and appear with all the excellent gravity described by lord coke wherever means like these are really necessary to give authority to government it would seem that the bulk of the people must be in a semi-barbarous state at least there was certainly nothing barbarous about the administration of criminal law in illinois before that state became what we call civilized indeed the judges were humane to a fault and whenever it became necessary for them to sentence a prisoner they were careful to state that they were but the humble agencies of justice possibly this extreme modesty reflected a wholesome self-depreciation but there is just a chance that it evidenced a live regard for their own personal safety in any event it is a fact that the judiciary assumed no unnecessary responsibility in the case of the people versus green the jury convicted the defendant of murder and the learned judge later a governor of the state was obliged to pronounce the death sentence mr green he began addressing the prisoner the jury in their verdict say you are guilty of murder and the law says you are to be hung now i want you and all your friends down on indian creek to know that it is not i who condemn you but the jury and the law mr green the law allows you time for preparation so the court wants to know what time you would like to be hung the prisoner allowed it made no difference to him but his honor did not appreciate this freedom of action mr green you must know it is a very serious matter to be hung he protested uneasily you'd better take all the time you can get the court will give you until this day four weeks he added tentatively the prisoner made no response but mr james turney the prosecutor apparently thinking the scene lacked impressiveness rose and addressed the bench may it please the court he began on solemn occasions like the present it is usual for the court to pronounce formal sentence in which the leading features of the crime shall be brought to the recollection of the prisoner and a sense of guilt impressed upon his conscience and in which he shall be duly exhorted to repentance and warned against the judgment in a world to come oh mr turney the judge interrupted testily mr green understands the whole matter as well as if i had preached to him a month he knows he's got to be hung this day four weeks you understand it that way mr green don't you he added appealing to the prisoner mr green nodded and the court adjourned now it may be that this cautious magistrate had too much consideration for the prisoner's sensitive friends on indian creek but our modern jurists who admittedly have the courage of their convictions might take a useful hint from his reticence for if criminals derive any benefit from judicial lectures or warnings the evidence of that fact has not yet been forthcoming but the pioneer judges were prudent in civil as well as in criminal cases they never instructed the jurors on the legal effect of testimony and rarely told them what they could or could not find from the facts occasionally however some solon bolder than his fellows would depart from this non-committal practice with results not always satisfactory in one case a judge who desired to display his learning instructed the jury very fully laying down the law with didactic authority but the jurors after deliberating some hours were unable to agree finally the foreman rose and asked for additional instructions judge this ere's the difficulty he explained the jury want to know if that thar what you told us was really the law or only just your notion these frontier proceedings were undoubtedly crude but they reflected the common sense of the people and it is fairly debatable whether the modern practice displays any marked advantage over the primitive methods certainly every legal appeal of today echoes the foreman's question and only too frequently the highest tribunals inform us after years of waiting that what we received from the court below was not really the law but 
only just the notion of a trial judge picturesque as was this old regime and practical as it was for pioneer conditions it speedily yielded to the march of progress and when lincoln joined the ranks of the profession it had virtually disappeared already the law of courthouses had given way to frame buildings and structures of brick and the steadily increasing immigration was bringing legal talent of a higher order than the state had ever known a new generation of judges and lawyers was soon to control the administration of justice and before many years the local bar of springfield was to produce jurists and statesmen of national repute End of chapter seven chapter eight of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill chapter eight lincoln's first partnership major stuart with whom lincoln had joined forces was not in his early years a well-read or even an industrious lawyer but he was popular and had an extensive if not very lucrative practice which he was entirely willing to entrust to his new associate indeed when the firm was formed he was so deeply engrossed in politics that he gave little or no attention to the law and lincoln had to assume virtually all responsibility for the business of course if the procedure had been complicated or technical a novice would have speedily come to grief but the character of litigation was very simple in those days the precedents were few and far between and the local forms exceeding elastic lincoln met such difficulties as there were in his own way asking as little advice as possible and exercising his ingenuity to bridge the gaps in his information when his partner was not available for consultation the habit of standing on his own feet and doing his own thinking which was thus forced upon him at the very outset of his practice became his most notable trait one of his contemporaries closely in touch with his professional life testifies that he never asked another lawyer's advice on any subject whatsoever he listened to his associates and consulted with them but he worked out his own problems and there was never anything of the brain tapper about his relations with the bar the influence of this early training is plainly discernible in the remarkable self-reliance and resourcefulness which he exhibited in his later years new questions did not confuse him he faced emergencies with perfect serenity and he had long been accustomed to responsibility when he was called upon to decide questions of national import springfield the new capital of illinois was a mere village when stuart and lincoln hung out their shingle the state house had not been built the sessions of the legislature were held in a church and the houses were scattered and poorly constructed the business scattered around a vacant plot of ground which passed for a public square and many of the lawyers offices were in their hats lincoln's partner however was a person of some importance in the community and his office was situated in hoffman's row over what was then the county courthouse compared with the luxury and convenience of modern law chambers the appointments of this office seemed somewhat meagre the furniture consisted of a roughly made table a few chairs a lounge a bench and an old wood stove and the library comprised five illinois reports and about twenty volumes of miscellaneous law books legislative reports and congressional documents arranged on clumsy board shelves nailed to the bare walls inadequate as this equipment may appear it was superior to that of the average country practitioner indeed mr conkling in his legal reminiscences of chicago states that there were not at that time half a dozen law libraries in the city which could boast a hundred volumes and that the revised statutes the illinois form book and a few elementary treatises constituted the usual legal outfit in this small bare and uninviting office lincoln passed much of his time for the next few years working there by day and sometimes remaining for the night sleeping on the crazy old lounge covered with a buffalo robe fortunately for him there was no necessity for such engrossing desk work as is now required of ambitious attorneys but there was more dull clerical routine than falls to the lot of the average practitioner of to-day all legal papers had to be written out in longhand and as there were no duplicating machines every additional copy meant considerable manual labor and most of this drudgery fell upon the junior partner 
he not only drew the papers but he kept the books of the firm and while stuart was in congress he tried almost all the cases that he had virtually no legal precedents to guide him was distinctly an advantage in these days of encyclopedias and digests a man who enters upon the study of law with a creative mind capable of logical deductions and close reasoning is apt to become case-ridden before he is fairly started on his practice many modern students unconsciously surrender their judgment to the guidance of the court of last resort their sense of justice sways with the prevailing opinion they cease to reason and merely parrot the latest decisions lincoln was subjected to no such stunting influences he reasoned out new propositions with an unbiased mind not with the idea of agreeing or disagreeing with the previous expressed conclusions of some other intellect but to get at the truth of the matter and it was doubtless this training which enabled him at a later period to state political issues with more originality and clearness than any other speaker of his day there is a story to the effect that when he argued his first appeal before the supreme court at springfield he announced that all the adjudications he had been able to find were against his contention and he would therefore merely read the decisions he had collated and submit the matter to the court if this story be true it is certainly fortunate that legal precedents were rare in illinois otherwise lincoln might have been browbeaten by authority as are some of our case lawyers of to-day the anecdote is not authenticated however and is probably apocryphal even if the young advocate had been doubtful of his cause he never would have meekly read it out of court with adverse decisions as a matter of self-interest he would have made the best possible argument for the public was largely represented at all judicial hearings and it was highly important for a beginner to make a good impression on the assembled audience he was far too shrewd to have made an exhibition of himself by quoting decisions against his own client and tamely submitting his cause to the court such a performance would have ruined a newcomer for it would have been laughed at in every corner of his small community before the day was over lincoln on the contrary made a favorable impression from the start and springfield soon came to hold his legal ability in high esteem although it was important for a young attorney to give a good account of himself in the public sessions of the courts it was scarcely less essential that he should make himself felt in the rough-and-tumble debates at the general store or other headquarters of public opinion the lawyer who waited for business to come to him in those days would never have built up a clientele the village forums were the places where reputations were won or lost and the man who made his mark there was soon sought as a legal champion lincoln more than held his own in these semi-public discussions and arguments and it was not long before his advent was hailed with delight by the habitues of speed's store the most popular arena in springfield but though his friends and neighbors recognized his ability and proclaimed it his uncouth appearance was decidedly against him and he not only failed to inspire strangers with confidence but actually invited their derision and contempt shortly after he became associated with stuart the latter sent him to try a case in mclean county for an englishman named badley giving him a letter of introduction which advised the client that he could rely upon the bearer to try his case in the best possible manner badley inspected his counsel's partner with amazement and chagrin the young man was six feet four awkward ungainly and apparently shy he was dressed in ill-fitting homespun clothes the trousers a little too short and the coat a trifle too large he had the appearance of a rustic on his first visit to the circus and as the client gazed on him his astonishment turned to indignation and rage what did stuart mean by sending a bumpkin of that sort to represent him it was preposterous insulting and not to be endured without attempting to conceal his disgust badly unceremoniously dispensed with lincoln's services and straightway retained james a mcdougall later a united states senator from california to take charge of the case history does not relate whether the irate englishman won or lost the cause but we know that he lived to become one of lincoln's most ardent admirers this was not the last time lincoln's personal appearance was to prejudice him in the practice of the law many years later stanton then one of the leading lawyers in the country was to snub the long-armed creature from illinois who presumed to assist him in a celebrated case 
and he also lived to revise his judgment and acknowledge the superiority of the man he flouted end of chapter eight chapter nine of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill chapter nine his early cases and competitors the record of lincoln's practice with stewart is very meagre and unsatisfactory the first case with which his name was connected as an attorney was hawthorne v woolridge one of three cases growing out of the same matter which was being litigated in stewart's office before lincoln was admitted to the bar and of which he apparently had charge during his apprenticeship the action however never came to trial being settled out of court and the papers indicate that it and the other cases with which it was connected made much ado about nothing a not uncommon feature of pioneer lawsuits people carried their differences into court far more readily in those days than they do now and petty actions for trespass assault and similar grievances filled the docket the conduct of such cases did not require any very intimate knowledge of law and as the advocates relied largely on fervid oratory to influence the juries lincoln had no trouble in meeting his opponents on even terms some of his early political speeches which have been preserved demonstrate that he was capable of providing flowery eloquence when occasion demanded it and he must have given the country jurors just the sort of talk they liked for he was admittedly successful as a pleader springfield instantly recognized him as a first-class stump speaker an irresistible mimic and an inimitable raconteur and it was not long before his humorous stories and dry witty remarks began to pass from mouth to mouth but he had been in practice fully a year before he demonstrated his qualities as a lawyer and then it was discovered that this tolerant good-natured attorney though slow to wrath was when once aroused a relentless enemy to the evil-doer one james adams who called himself a general and posed as a lawyer became a candidate for the office of probate justice in springfield at or about the same time a widow named anderson discovered that someone had forged her husband's name to a deed of his real estate and that the property to which she supposed she was entitled stood in the name of general adams at this stage of the proceeding she retained stuart and lincoln and trouble began for the general lincoln speedily made up his mind that this man was a scoundrel and he not only brought suit for the recovery of the widow's property but camped on adams trail attacking him with handbills newspaper articles and in the courts and never resting until he unearthed a copy of a new york indictment charging him with another forgery and describing him as a person of evil name and fame and of wicked disposition this put the general to flight the woman won her suit and recovered the property and lincoln's services as a lawyer began to be in demand but though his cases were numerous they were not very lucrative only two or three of the fees recorded in the firm's book for the year eighteen thirty seven amount to fifty dollars and most of the entries show five dollars charged as a trial fee a chancery case under date eighteen thirty seven eight shows a debit of fifty dollars below which is written credit by coat to stuart fifteen dollars making the net cash charge thirty five dollars which indicates that the firm sometimes took it out in trade these modest retainers however do not by any means indicate that stuart and lincoln were unsuccessful or even in a small way of business the firm ranked well in springfield and the capital was at that period second only to chicago in importance in the state of illinois the days of great retainers and vast fortunes accumulated in the practice of law had not yet arrived and the highest legal authorities in the land did not command very princely revenues there is reason to believe that daniel webster's income from the practice of his profession did not average ten thousand dollars a year and often fell far short of it lincoln never kept any private account books and the firm records are incomplete so it is impossible to tell exactly what his early practice was worth in dollars and cents at all events it was sufficient with his salary as state legislator to enable him to pay his expenses and reduce his debts and this was his only ambition in monetary matters in eighteen thirty nine while lincoln was attending the sessions of the legislature a company of players on tour reached the city and their adventures as described by the late dean of the american stage 
than a little lad of ten give an excellent picture of the times springfield being the capital of illinois writes mr jefferson in his autobiography it was determined to devote the entire season to the entertainment of the members of the legislature having made money for several weeks previous to our arrival the manager resolved to hire a lot and build a theatre the building of a theatre in those days did not require the amount of capital that it does now folding opera chairs were unknown gas was an occult mystery not yet acknowledged as a fact by the unscientific world of the west the new theatre was about ninety feet deep and about forty feet wide no attempt was made at ornamentation and as it was unpainted the simple lines of architecture upon which it was constructed gave it the appearance of a large dry goods box with a roof i do not think my father nor mr mackenzie his partner had ever owned anything with a roof until now so they were naturally proud of their possession in the midst of our rising fortunes a heavy blow fell upon us a religious revival was in progress at the time and the fathers of the church not only launched forth against us in their sermons but by some political manoeuvre got the city to pass a new law enjoining a heavy license against our unholy calling i forget the amount but it was large enough to be prohibitory here was a terrible condition of affairs all our available funds invested the legislature in session the town full of people and we by a heavy license denied the privilege of opening the new theatre in the midst of these troubles a young lawyer called upon the manager he had heard of the injustice and offered if they would place the matter in his hands to have the license taken off declaring that he only desired to see fair play and he would accept no fee whether he failed or succeeded the young lawyer began his harangue he handled the subject with tact skill and humour tracing the history of the drama from the time when thespis acted in a cart to the stage of today he illustrated his speech with a number of anecdotes and kept the council in a roar of laughter his good humour prevailed and the exorbitant tax was taken off this young lawyer continues mr jefferson was very popular in springfield and was honoured and beloved by all who knew him and after the time of which i write he held a rather important position in the government of the united states he now lies buried near springfield under a monument commemorating his greatness and his virtues and his name was abraham lincoln there are many more or less authentic anecdotes concerning lincoln's early practice but neither the character of the litigation in which he was engaged nor its remuneration affords any fair criterion of his legal ability he should be judged by the place he won for himself among his contemporaries and to estimate the value of that judgment it is necessary to know his competitors and what manner of men they were the newly settled states attracted immigration of a high order of intelligence and illinois was particularly fortunate in its new citizens young men came from the east and the south americans of energy ambition and strength who rapidly adapted themselves to their new surroundings and became thoroughly identified with the local interests douglas baker logan edwards mcclernand stewart trumbull mcdougall browning hardin davis lincoln every one of them came of english-speaking progenitors and only one was foreign-born these were some of the men with whom lincoln associated almost from the outset of his practice and many of them were already admitted to the bar when he joined the ranks of the profession that they were a remarkably talented company does not admit of doubt among the members of the backwoods legislature to which lincoln was first elected were a future president of the united states a future candidate for the presidency six future united states senators eight future members of congress a future cabinet secretary and no less than three future judges of the state to say nothing of other men who distinguished themselves professionally in later years almost without exception these men were lawyers and lincoln met and practised against them during the three-and-twenty years of his professional life to have held his own in such a brilliant coterie would certainly have been a creditable achievement but it can be demonstrated that lincoln not only held his own but early in his career became one of the leaders if not the leader of the springfield bar it may be urged however that many of his competitors were politicians and not lawyers of marked ability so it is proper to examine their records a little more minutely stephen t logan 
who came originally from kentucky was elected a judge of the circuit court and is admitted to have been the best nisi prius trial lawyer in the state he was undoubtedly the leader of the illinois bar for many years edward dickinson baker the illinois congressman leader of the california bar and the united states senator from oregon had a national reputation as an orator and as a jury advocate he was second to none in illinois as long as he practiced in that state he and lincoln were pitted against each other in the courts term after term stephen arnold douglas a public prosecutor at twenty-two and a judge at twenty-eight congressman united states senator and candidate for the presidency has always been recognized as one of the ablest men of his day and his seven years career at the illinois bar is scarcely paralleled for its brilliancy in the legal annals of the united states certainly he and lincoln were adversaries often enough to leave no doubt as to which had the better legal mind james a mcdougall who supplanted lincoln in his case for the englishman badly afterwards became attorney general for the state of illinois and united states senator from california and despite his eccentricities was unquestionably a lawyer of ability lyman trumbull united states senator from illinois was distinguished at the bar long before he won political honors and every writer with knowledge of those times includes him among the eminent practitioners of his day and david davis judge of the eighth illinois circuit united states senator and associate justice of the supreme court of the united states at washington was of course a jurist of national repute leaving the question of his relative standing in the profession at large for further consideration it is confidently submitted that lincoln won a notable standing at the local bar almost at the outset of his career among contemporaries who were not only capable lawyers but men of exceptional force and character indeed it is exceedingly doubtful if the bar of any other state in the union equaled that of the frontier state of illinois in professional ability when lincoln won his spurs End of chapter nine Chapter 10 of Lincoln the Lawyer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry, Johnson City, Tennessee. Lincoln the Lawyer by Frederick Trevor Hill. Chapter 10 The Managing Clerk. When Lincoln was postmaster of New Salem, he used to tuck the letters inside his hat and deliver them whenever he happened to meet the persons to whom they were addressed. As this is a fair example of his business system, it may readily be imagined that the office of Stuart and Lincoln was not a model establishment, where there was a place for everything and everything in its place. And it was not. Indeed, as a managing clerk, the junior partner would have been a hopeless failure, and as an attorney, in the technical sense of the term, he would never have distinguished himself. He disliked everything connected with the drudgery of legal routine, hated drawing the declarations and pleas, despised artificialities and refinements which were even then beginning to creep into the pleadings and disregarded forms whenever it was possible to do so. There was nothing mechanical, precise, or methodical about the man, and all those housewifey virtues which characterized the careful, orderly, exact solicitor, he was utterly deficient. He never knew where his papers were, and apparently the only attempt he ever made to better the disorder was to write on one of the bundles of papers which littered his desk. When you can't find it anywhere else, look in this. But that was long after the firm of Stewart and Lincoln had dissolved. And even then we find his explaining to a correspondent that he had placed his letter inside an old hat and had thus neglected answering it, which shows he had not wholly outgrown the habit of his post-office days. 
Indeed, his hat continued to be his favorite receptacle for papers as long as he lived, and he never acquired any sense of order. Fortunately for his peace of mind, Stuart had no more system in business affairs than his associate, and the result of their lax methods was, of course, confusion worse confounded. Again and again we find Lincoln reporting to his partner in Washington that clients had called for deeds which could not be found and that papers were wanted which had disappeared and there is no proof that the major was ever able to help in the search. In fact, neither man took even ordinary business precautions and if either of them kept copies of letters, no evidence of fact has yet been discovered. Certainly Lincoln's private correspondence was conducted in the loosest possible fashion. He would write on whatever happened to be handy, and his notes for law work or speeches were scribbled on the backs of envelopes, edges of newspapers, or other available material. Most of these memoranda found their way sooner or later into his capacious stovepipe, and when any particular item was needed, the search which followed suggested the conjurer's hat trick. Lincoln was too philosophical to be bored or irritated by the details or minutiae of the profession. He simply ignored them. The argus-eyed attorney who sees that every T is crossed and every I is dotted, doubtless fulfills the useful function in the practice of law. But Lincoln was not a lawyer of this quality. Indeed, it must be conceded that in all such matters, another distinguished president of legal antecedents decisively outranks him. Thomas Jefferson was a master of accounts and bookkeeping. He was a champion diarist of the world, the most methodical of statisticians, and the neatest, most precise man of business. Whoever tied papers with red tape and sealed them with green seals, and yet he would never be classed among the great lawyers of the nation. Fancy Jefferson or any other capable manager writing a client in this fashion and turning good business from the door. As to the real estate, we cannot attend to it. We are not real estate agents. We are lawyers. We recommend you to give the charge of it to Mr. Isaac S. Britton, a trustworthy man and one whom the Lord made on purpose for such business. Perhaps this letter displays poor commercial judgment and doubtless it shocked and grieved the thrifty man with whom Lincoln was associated when he wrote it, but it shows that he had his own ideas of the dignity of the profession and did not propose to barter it. Lincoln's mind was orderly, though his methods were not. He neglected details because his thought, which was as direct as light, passed instantly to the vital spot, and all else seems unimportant. If I can free this case from technicalities and get it properly swung to the jury, I'll win it, he used to say, and this was his mental attitude toward all legal questions. He had no training in technicalities as long as the firm of Stewart and Lincoln lasted, and it is doubtful if any teaching would have qualified him for attorney work or made him a master of detail. Yet, as an office lawyer, such as rules the destinies of our modern corporate interests, he probably would have been invaluable. His mind comprehended large subjects without the slightest effort. Once concentrated on an issue, he passed directly to the point, disregarded the thousand and one contingencies all the academic pros and cons and reduced the problem to its simplest possible form. The man who is constantly mindful of details is apt to attach too much importance to small things, 
and with such a man compromises are difficult, if not impossible. Lincoln had no training of this sort to overcome, and the result is constantly apparent in all his important actions of later years. It is not, of course, contended that his unmethodical habits and loose business training prove his legal aptitude, but it is submitted that they do not define his limitations as a lawyer. His natural perceptions were too keen, his mind too generously Catholic, to admit the discipline enforced by the usual legal training. Education of that sort would probably have warped his natural talents, and the result might have been a conscientious family solicitor instead of the great adviser of the nation. He needed the freedom of an office innocent of the patent letter files and card catalog indices to develop his individuality. He demanded the growing room of a new country where the practice of the law was not conventionalized, out of all meaning and forms, did not restrict. He required the self-discipline which comes of personal, unguided effort and unhandicapped competition, and he found the requisite conditions and his free and easy association with Major Stewart. The independence and possibility which he experienced in this partnership allowed him to exercise and express his individuality at the time when stricter discipline and more technical teaching would have fretted him or molded his maturing mind in a different fashion. As it was, he developed naturally into a broad-minded counselor who reverend the law without worshipping it, and whose sense of justice was not dulled by contract with unyielding precedence. If Stewart had been ambitious to accumulate a fortune, he would have been disappointed with his partner. For with a people, with litigious as the early Illinois settlers, it was a simple matter to stir up strife and make work for the lawyer. And Lincoln, instead of egging clients into courts, set his face against such practice. Discourage litigation, was his advice to lawyers. Persuade your neighbors to compromise whenever you can. Point out to them how the nominal winner is often the real loser in fees, expenses, and waste of time. As a peacemaker, the lawyer has a superior opportunity of becoming a good man. There will always be enough business. Never stir up litigation. A worse man can scarcely be found than one who does this. Who can be nearly a friend than he who habitually overhauls the register of deeds in scars of defects in titles? whereon to stir up a strife and put money in his pocket. A moral tone ought to be infused into the profession, which should drive such men out of it. It is truly said that those words should be posted in every law office in the land, and it will be seen when Lincoln's record is fully examined that it was not a mere theorist who wrote them but an active partitioner of wide experience who lived up to his own teaching. End of chapter 10